herein may be found an account in aggregate of the many travesties and disasters that befell humanity in the Terran year 2286, and specifically the fall of Earth and the exile of humanity. I, Jeremy Michaels, write these words for the benefit of posterity, in hope of a time when we may return to our homeworld and learn from our many mistakes. It was near the end of January 2286 that the monsters were sighted. The exact date will vary depending on whom you ask. Some claim that sensors showed odd light patterns coming from Gamma Crucis as early as the 21st, and that these emissions were a harbinger of the destruction to come. Others attest that nothing came as a warning, and the first we knew of the entities was the 28th, when they emerged from the void on the edge of our solar system. The Dyson Net alerted us to the intrusion and gave us our first glimpses of the creatures that we would come to call the Astrosaurs. At first, they were little more than blips on the readouts of radar screens, moving too swiftly and erratically for our telescopes to focus on. But then they approached the net, giving us a good look at their appearance. Though much smaller than expected for travelers in the astral sea, for creatures, they were gargantuan. They were quadrupeds, with enormous wings, a long tail, and a long neck, upon which stood a cross between the head of an elder dragon and the cockpit of an atmospheric fighter craft. From nose to tail tip, they were each longer than a playing field in a hedron stadium. Their wings would have seemed to cover the entire stadium, seating and all. As they closed on a handful of Dyson nodes, their surface came into focus. Though their form was that of a dragon, their skin shone metallic, all grays and cobalt blue. Then they transmitted the message, the one that still lives in the minds of all humanity. Humans, this to you, the rot has rooted well within you. Submit to the harrowing and endure. Resist and be annihilated. The rot that creeps, this to you. Extraction, extermination, exile. This was transmitted in all the major languages used in our fleets. Then the feeds showed static, and those Dyson nodes ceased to transmit. The fleets were mobilized. The Imperator's vanguard assembled swiftly in orbit over Mars and the 3rd, 5th, and ninth fleets, all back in the system from patrolling the Sovrilock border, gathered their strength around Jupiter. Hundreds, even a thousand or more vessels, from humble gunboats to lumbering deep space cores the size of asteroids or even small countries, all arrayed as the sword in humanity's hand against the dragon in the night. What could hope to withstand such a force? Then they came, though few in number, at only nineteen, nineteen even. Each one of the astrosaurs carried unto themselves an arsenal of destruction to rival the hordes of Apollyon. Preceding them was a cosmic storm of such scale we only knew could come from the sun. It washed over the Imperial Earth fleets as a wave upon rocks. The greatest of our ships 
the giant spheres that were the deep space cores weathered the barrage, sheltered by their own prodigious magnetic fields. But the vast numbers of smaller craft and frigate vessels, too far from their colossal parents, were devastated, suffering heat and irradiation even beyond the nightmarish Chernobyl incident. After the radiation storm, the 19 astrosaurs closed in. From beyond visual range, and traveling along navigational paths that our meager technology could not hope to match, they unleashed scores of guided projectiles at the great deep space cores. Though our behemoth capital ships could survive radiation and energy weapons, there was no defense against these tiny, artificial meteors. Too fast to detect, and too large to deflect, only an atmosphere would stop them. Alas, we had none to use as a shield. One by one, our greatest defenses fell. The Imperator, in either arrogance or bloodlust, was aboard his own flagship, the Nyx, during the entire conflict. When the cores suffered devastation, the Nyx began to flee, but there was no escape. The nineteen astrosaurs descended on his ship in unison, diving into its massive superstructure and rending it apart from within. Mere moments later, they emerged unscathed in all directions. The Nyx then exploded breaking apart into massive fragments scattered outward, some to the sun, some into orbit, and some into the void. Thus fell the Imperator. It was February 3rd, 2286. With humanity's arms broken, the invading force dispersed across the solar system subjugating various orbital stations around the planets and asteroid belt. In a week, only Earth remained untouched. Finally, the 19 astrosaurs descended upon Earth. They found chaos. In the wake of the Imperator's death, the Vigilant Favored attempted to keep the existing order in place, but as word came from the rest of the system, that humanity was utterly quelled beneath the astral talons. Faith in the system evaporated. Riots surged in every major city on the globe, as Earth's citizens demanded protection from the coming destruction. But the vigilant favored could not provide. Eighteen of the nineteen astrosaurs left the system. The remaining one descended to the surface of Earth, over the floating megatropolis of Nietzscheheim. It was our political central hub at the time. A fool in the military attempted to open fire on it with planetary anti-air weaponry. The astrosaur responded by blasting all near military installations and much of the industrial sector with plasma. Once it was satisfied that resistance was utterly finished, it landed, and to our amazement, opened itself. Two dozen miniature, bipedal versions of itself walked out. Then it rose into the air, and flew off into the horizon. From here, accounts become fragmented. After the initial landing of the astrosaur at Nietzscheheim, Communications with the rest of the globe, the solar system, and other Earth outposts in other star systems were broken. Anecdotes have been assembled over many years since, but they remain anecdotal. Saturday, February 13th, 2286, marks the last day of old human history. Everything since is piecemeal shared only by those factions of humans that have been able to retain them. Thankfully, 
historical databases of everything up until that date survive to the present day, but these years since are much less certain. I have taken to calling this the Sundered Age. Herein follows what I have been able to determine from the sources I have collected and the interviews I have conducted. The Astrosaur, after depositing the two dozen miniature versions of itself, visited five other major cities on Earth, and likewise invested two dozen miniatures in each. Definitely in these other five metropolises were New Mandela, Hong Kong, and Arctic Cascadia, but the remaining two are disputed. Chicago is a possibility, as are Greenwich, Johannesburg, Gygax, and Obelisk, but witnesses bear conflicting reports. In each city, the two dozen minisaurs occupied the central government facilities, commandeered the comm systems, and instituted martial law. It is unknown exactly how 24 minisaurs alone in a city with millions of humans were able to accomplish this. Theories include chemically induced obedience and nanite swarms. Evidence of both has been recovered, but not holistically. With the populace under their thumb, the minisaurs began searching among the citizenry for humans bearing certain criteria. At the time, it was not clear who was targeted, but in hindsight, we know they were sifting through us to find any connected with the vigilant favored. The humans they did not want were released from custody unharmed. This was confirmed by interview of released detainees. As for those they did want, we do not know a definite fate. They were never seen again. This process went on for three months. By mid-May, the Minisaur's search operation was complete. Martial law remained in effect, and a global blackout continued. For what they were waiting, we could only guess. In June, rumors spread across the globe. An astrosaur had been sighted entering the atmosphere over Volgograd. It then either landed in the city, or met with the lone remaining astrosaur that had been Earth's constant companion since February 13th. The first reports of massive construction efforts in Asia Minor followed this report. We did not then know what they were building, but resources were being diverted to that area from all over the globe. Metals, plastics, nanotubes, and more. Whatever the object of construction was, it was enormous. By the beginning of July, we on the planet's surface could see blips in the sky overhead, even in daylight. They looked to be little more than gray-white splotches of color in the sky. They were larger than the stars, though certainly smaller than our moon. Week after week, they expanded, slowly becoming distinct in shape. They were spacecraft of a sort, but bigger than anything humanity had ever attempted before. They dwarfed even the deep space cores used to travel to the distant outpost and colony systems, from whom we had heard nothing since February. After months of waiting for a change in our circumstances, one finally came. It was September 4th when the announcement went out from the minisaurs in all major cities. We that is to say, all of humanity, were to be loaded onto the hulking vessels in Earth orbit and sent away to other star systems. In our absence, the minisaurs and astrosaurs would destroy the technological infrastructure of the planet, 
eradicating every last trace of something they referred to as the contamination. Horror set in across the globe. We were being deported from Earth. Whatever pacification techniques the Minisaurs were implementing suddenly were insufficient. Riots and insurgencies surged into being. Two were coup attempts, months in the making, in Chicago and New Mandela. Madrid and Baltimore simply lost their minds and turned to rioting in the streets. All attempts at protest or overthrow were quelled by the Minisaurs. Chicago, in particular, was a bloodbath. My investigation leads me to suspect a nanite-esque weapon was deployed as crowd control. The survivors I have interviewed describe odd dark clouds darting through the city streets, swallowing entire mobs in their form, and leaving only a stomach-churning mess behind. They don't like to talk about that day much. The few survivors from Madrid I have had the opportunity to question refuse to describe at all what was done to crush the resistance there. My last day on Earth was September 27th. It was finally my turn to board one of the behemoth deportation vessels, one of the new arcs, as it were. More than five billion of us had been extracted from the planet. There were billions yet to remove. Our alien masters remained implacable, however. They would not rest until Earth had not a single human left on it. I suppose we should be grateful that they elected to displace us rather than eradicate us. Fifteen years have passed. My vessel, which we have been permitted to name the Mammoth, is orbiting the red giant Gamma Crucis. I know other Ark ships have been detected in the same system. Are we all orbiting this star, this top of the Southern Cross constellation? Or are some of the Ark ships in entirely different regions of the universe? How did we get here so quickly? It took only a year to arrive here. This colony ship has no rip drive. The Minisaurs on board have given some of our technologically inclined members occupations, but they refuse to completely enlighten us on the technology behind their incredible travel capabilities. Where does our food come from? Is everything truly recycled for such a large population? And the biggest question on all of our minds, what comes next for humanity? Are we doomed to an existence of being livestock in astral paddocks? Will we eventually be returned to our home planet? Our hosts have not been forthcoming, saying only that we must wait for the contamination to be completely erased from existence. I wish I had even an inkling as to what that could mean.